Good evening. I am Jaskirat, the session coordinator, and I welcome you all here in this session of broadcast broadband convergence. So before we begin, I would like to highlight a few hygiene instructions for ensuring a smooth running of the session. All attendees except the spe session speakers will be kept on mute throughout the session by default. If you have any questions for the speakers, please type them in the Q&A tab. You may interact, interact with the fellow attendees live using the chat tab during the session. If you want to enlarge your presentation, please click the expanding arrow icon on the top right of the presenting screen. This webinar is, is being recorded and will be put on and will be posted to the TSDSI website within the next few days. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Major General Pritam Vishnoi, who is the convener of this session. Major General Dr. Pritam Bishnoi, Vishist Seva Medal, retired, joined the Indian Army on 9 June 1984 in the Corps of Signals. He superannuated on 31 July 2021. He has 37 years of experience in provisioning of military communication in the Indian Army. He has been working in the policy form formulation in respect of cyberspace, communication, information systems, electronic warfare, and information warfare during his tenure in the military. He is associated with the TSDSI as a consultant technical since 17 August 2021. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jaskirat. First and foremost thing, I thank to One Media 3.0 for sponsoring this session Session 6, Broadcast Broadband Convergence. Especially thanks to Sesh Sir, who is also one of the keynote speaker. Thank you very much, sir, for the same. This session has six keynote speakers, and there will be a Q&A &A session in the last once all the six keynote speakers have done with their part. With this, I will now introduce to you both the co-chair session, uh, Ms. Minakshi Singhvi. Ms. Minakshi Singhvi is working as Director Maintenance at West Zone Mumbai. She has worked at various FM and microwave installations and have professional experience of 23 years in the field of broadcasting. She has been awarded with Akashwani Annual Award for Technical Excellence for Tuning of FM Combiner and BES Award for Best Technical Innovations in Audio Noise Reduction Techniques. Our second co-chair session is Mr. Pranav Jha. Pranav Jha works with IIT Bombay, Mumbai, India as a senior scientist. His current research interest lies in broadcast broadband convergence, rural broadband, broadband communications and network architecture for 5G and beyond. Now I invite Ms. Minakshi Singhvi to give the opening remarks for the session. Over to Ms. Minakshi Singhvi, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Asif. Greetings to all. It's a privilege to speak in this annual technical deep drive conference organized by TSDSI. I'm more delighted, especially being part of this particular session, which is on broadcast and broadband convergence. Broadly speaking, convergence means bringing technologies together in such a way to provide easier access of technology to the consumer at affordable and lower cost. And in present world, everything needs to be tuned from consumer's perspective. Technology which is aligned to consumer's taste can only sustain. Friends, 
Broadcast and broadband convergence is the most discussed and debated development in the media over the past decade or more. Terrestrial broadcasting and mobile broadband once used to be completely separate and successful kingdoms are facing challenges. As demand for consumption of multimedia content on mobile phone is increasing exponentially in every part of the world and because people are using mobile unicast data to meet this requirement, telecom networks are getting congested and they are unable to satisfy large population under peak demand. This is particularly true for live events and other linear channels of program services. Whereas broadcasters have though effectively managed to deliver media on demand basis to fix television search, however not so successful to deliver the content on mobile search on their own without help of mobile data and broadband. Therefore, in the current scenario, where the smartphone and related devices have become the primary device for content consumption, broadcasters should look for adoption of digital technologies which allows efficient delivery of high demand content by using broadcast spectrum and content deliverable directly on smartphones. For that to happen, converged broadcast and broadband network could be a correct choice. At present, analog terrestrial TV broadcasting is becoming obsolete all over the world and transitioning from analog to digital broadcasting is increasing. Therefore, the use of IP based terrestrial digital TV technology which is operable in the existing vacated TV band and which can easily deliver content directly on mobile platform can fulfill this current needs. As a broadcaster, of course, content is our priority, but apart from the content, delivery mode on suitable media devices need to be given equal weightage. And broadcaster need, needs to align their mode of operations accordingly. It is also important to mention here that all the improvements and upgradation in the transmission and broadcast technology should also address enabling mechanism in receiving systems also in parallel. It means that D2M or any for any such technology to be successful, the availability of mobile sets capable of receiving TV signals directly on their smartphone must be ensured. There needs to be compliance testing to ensure interoperability across existing devices as well as future devices. In the past, various technologies fell short of this desired goal due to the la lack of compliant receiving systems at the end user. So conclusion is that uh, a platform which can provide addressability, mobility, interactivity, good bandwidth, cheap delivery and connectivity to the internet world would be able to sustain and stand against any challenge. For traditional broadcasters, 5G is also a challenge. So appropriate means needs to be innovated to ride on the 5G wave without losing one's identity and motive of service to the public. And since the very objective of public broadcaster is service to the nation, government support is equally needed from time to time. Public broadcaster has a very unique role and responsibility. Not only they are responsible to deliver news, information, live events related to public importance, but also has an important role in emergency and disaster management. And all this information should reach to all citizens across all platforms. With passing years, the definition or rather I would say the requirement of convergence has changed. OTT, DTH, IPTV, Smart TV, Hybrid TV all are enabling convergence only and now direct to mobile. So 
should broadcasting be fully dependent on internet data delivery system or over the air on broadcast frequencies should still be a priority for government and broadcasters how government policy and standardization can help each one of us to survive while contributing efficiently in national progress information dissemination and service to the public what should be the road map of technology in broadcasting what should be the enabling ecosystem and environment for future broadcast technology so in this session all these questions will be addressed challenges use cases and various developments happening all across the world in broadcast and broadband convergence will be discussed we are really lucky to have very well known and reputed experts from all across the globe in this session i'm sure this session is going to be very interesting and engaging and i request all the participants and audiences to raise their query and ask questions without any hesitation once again i would like to thank and express my gratitude to tsdsi for providing me this opportunity to co-chair this session thank you thank you very much ma'am for the opening remarks now i would request mr sesh shima the keynote speaker keynote one he will speak on evolution of 5g convergence of ATSC dash D2M. Mr. Shesh is responsible for Sinclair One Media's activities in India to realize direct to mobile in India's billion strong mobile ecosystem. He works closely with Sankhya Lab in chipset and system development, international standards development, and engagement with carriers broadcasters and government now over to mr sesh shima over to you sir um thank you namaste uh, pritam ji and i think my presentation which has been recorded is going to be played now namaste this is sesh simha with one media and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank TSDSI for giving me the slot to present the evolution of 5G convergence of ATSC3 for direct to mobile or DTM services. I will now share my screen and we'll start the presentation. This slide summarizes some of the key attributes of ATSC3 that motivates its possible usage with 5GS for multicast and broadcast services. First and foremost, it is a purpose-built standard for optimum broadcast multicast performance, providing support for both large and small coverage areas with high towers, and with small cells. It has got excellent mobility support and can operate both in multi-frequency network mode and single frequency network mode. It has a high spectral efficiency using a very high mod card like 4K QAM. Continuing with some of the attributes, one is it's a mature and complete standard deployed in the United States with about 60% of population covered and growing and in Korea. It gives the capability to improve resource utilization across multiple spectrum resources. Broadcast capacity could be provisioned on demand and updated as per traffic needs. This flexible capacity allocation through the use of a separate purpose-built direct-to-mobile network. And finally, 
on-demand coverage improvement for broadcast mode delivery of OTT content and TV services. And one classic example is the IPL finals, which you know breaks world records in terms of simultaneous viewership. So you can think of providing IPL on broadcast to large metro area with the significant savings in the number of simultaneous sessions. Some of the use cases that ATSC 3 for 5GS with MBS are good for is first data offload of audio, video, and other content. Offload of unicast sessions or multicast broadcast sessions from NG RAN to an MB session in ATSC 3. This will help reduce congestion in the cellular network. Also provide rural coverage to sparsely populated areas. One advantage is there's no SIM card required. So the use of ATSC 3 is can be free from 3GPP subscription control. And finally, Spectrum could be utilized from both broadcast bands and IMT bands with rasters that range from 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and 20 megahertz. This slide shows you why ATSC3 is good for direct to mobile and what are its unique qualities. As a purpose built standard for broadcast and as a complete IP um, transport capability, um, it is uh, gives you that easy capability to, to do that convergence. With optimized bit interleaved code modulation, we get very, very close to the Shannon limit. Very important attribute is the fact that it has a time interleaver that plays a dominant role in harsh mobile fading channels. And, and I'll walk you through some of the graphs that show this advantage shortly. The ATSC3 frame structure provides tremendous extensibility for future proofing. And, and one example of that is, is we could allow a Phi version that is battery saving for direct to mobile, for wearables, and for IoT applications. And finally, it's got the capability to do what's called layer division multiplexing that superimposes signals both in time and frequency domain to efficiently support multi-tiered services. So, so you could simultaneously and efficiently support D2M as well as fixed ultra high definition services. And some of these advantages are captured in a paper that is going to be published in IEEE BTS transactions in 2023. The lead authors are from ETRI in Korea that have done this analysis. So this particular graph uh, shows explicitly the comparison and performance of C over N for three cases, five, 10, and 15 megabits per second in an eight megahertz channel using the India Urban Channel model. And this work has been done by ETRI and Projira. And if we focus on the third graph, at 15 megabits case, you can see that, that in a stationary pedestrian mode, there's a 3.5 dB of CNR advantage. And that goes can go as much as 10 dB as the speed of the device starts to grow. And you can see that, that at, at 60, 60 kilometers per hour, the 3GPP solution uh, becomes non-decodable. This next slide shows the same information in a tabular format. So you can very easily see that, that those advantages, for example, at five megabits per second and 200 kilometers per hour, we have 11 dB advantage. At 15 megabits per second and 16 kilo, at 60 kilometers per hour, that's a 10 dB advantage. So additional research has been planned in 2023 
The first is, is hardware-based comparisons that will allow actual field testing comparisons and an additional work to be done to, to compare the performance of ATSC3 and NRMBS. So the net effect in terms of network cost, both CapEx and OpEx, is substantial savings if you had to deploy a nationwide network. You know, for example, if we looked at a small cell deployment of 30,000 sites, then, then, you know, just for fixed reception, indoor reception, uh, the, the, the additional sites required for FEMBMS would be as much as 40 to 60%. And if we're looking at mobile reception, then that would be 140 to 200% more sites. So, so if we looked at pure mobile, if you needed 30,000 sites, then you could you could immediately see that that you'd need somewhere upwards of 70 to 80 and 90,000 sites for FEMBMS. So, so in general, a five degree, degree increase in C over N doubles the required number of sites. And, and this graph on the right-hand side walks you through some of the different use cases and showing you know, the percent increase in number of sites. So once we've established the um, advantages in terms of performance, let's now go and see, you know, what's going on with the roadmap for this convergence. So if we if we look at ATSC3 and treat it as a standalone downlink radio access technology, then the interworking would be achieved at the core network level not at the device level, there, won't, there would not be standards-based requirement at the device level. The ATSC3 terminal equipment would be assumed not to be controlled by 5GS, similar to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So in SA199E, a, a mini work item description was approved for standardization in release 19 to support interworking with 5G MBS. So there are two likely ATSC3 network architectures that will evolve. In, in places like India, this could be one or few broadcast network operators with nationwide spectrum. And in the case of the US, that model is, is, is quite different. It would consist of multiple BNOs in each circle or each market, each with own spectrum and core resources. The next slide walks you through some of the individual members who have supported this work item, led by Sankhya Labs, IIT Bombay, Prasad Bharti, Legado, and many other members of TSDSI, uh, the IITs, and we're thankful, thanks for that. And on the other side, you'll see some of the large um, 5G ecosystem players like HP Enterprise, Reliance Geo, Dish Network, Samsung, Intel, Qualcomm, Airtel, and the Indian Department of Telecom. So if we get if we if we go down and in, into the weeds and, and I want to just point out you know some of the issues that would need to be addressed. Firstly, with access, traffic, steering, switching, and splitting, or ATSSS, there are current limitations. One of them is the fact that ATSSS based on multipath TCP is not suitable. Secondly, if one were to conceive of using multipath quick, then that needs enhancements that would have to be considered in 3GPP. However, in drawing a parallel with WLAN, Wi-Fi integration has not been broadly adopted despite being under development for 17 years. So even so, there is a high level of mobile broadband traffic carried over WLAN. In fact, in the US, this is estimated to be as much as 70% in increasing. So what we can say is that where there is a will, and a need, there is a way. So these limitations are not uh, 
certainly going to be uh, defeating. In conclusion, this is my final slide. There is a significant performance gap between ATSC3 and 3GPP-based multicast broadcast physical layer standards. The fact that ATSC3 Phi is not in 3GPP should not deter the adoption of broadcast. Given that, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the DTM terminal can provide a satisfactory interworking experience without the need for deep integration. The broadcast core and 5G core networks could be sufficiently harmonized to allow offload of content that makes sense to broadcast. And there is key support from 5G stakeholders to make this successful. And on that note, I'd like to thank you. And here are my contact, both uh, my email address and my cell phone address. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sesh Shima, for the nice presentation. Now we will go to the keynote address two. I will introduce the speaker, Ms. Madeline Noland. Madeline Noland is the president of Advanced Television System Committee, widely respected for her consensus building leadership style. She chaired the ATSC technology group that oversees the ATSC 3.0 next generation broadcast standard before being named ATSC president in May 2019. Previously, she chaired various ATSC 3.0 related specialist groups, ad hoc groups, and implementation team since 2012. I would request you, ma'am, to speak on ATSC 3.0-5G harmonization for broadcast broadband convergence as a keynote speaker too. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor. I'll share my screen. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Namaste. Um, I'm uh, here to talk with you about what's going on in ATSC 3.0 from a deployment perspective, as well as a development perspective, and how it comes to play into the 5G harmonization for broadcast broadband convergence. I'd also like to thank TSDSI and One Media 3.0 for this opportunity to speak with everyone today. Sorry for that. One moment. First, uh, we'd like to discuss the quick agenda. We will do an ATSC 3.0 deployment update. Then we'll talk about converged network advantages, ATSC 3.0 advancements, ATSC 3.0 5G convergence and potential technical architectures, and how ATSC members are working toward convergence in the standards body. Some of this will be a repeat from what Seish Sima just presented, and I will try to go a little bit deeper in those areas. Ma'am, your presentation is not visible to the audience. Thank you, sir. Let me try again.
Bear with me. It's okay now? Okay, thumbs up, I see. Thank you. Um, so first on the agenda is to discuss the deployments, uh, making sure everybody understands where ATSC is going. So ATSC 3.0 was first deployed in South Korea. What's interesting to me is that each country that deploys ATSC 3.0 has its own unique use case, which is the most important one. In the case of South Korea, the most important thing was to deploy ATSC 3.0 in order to deliver ultra high definition content to the people of Korea. Currently, ATSC 3.0 is available in all the major cities in South Korea. We're covering over 70% of the population and they reached their goal of delivering 4K content in time for the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, which took place in February of 2018. In the United States, the ATSC 3.0 deployment is continuing apace. Unlike Korea, in the United States, this is a voluntary deployment. In South Korea, it was a government mandated deployment. So here in the US, we're very pleased that broadcasters are busy deploying ATSC 3.0 and next gen TV services across the nation and reaching roughly 60% of the nation today. It's expected that we will be close to 65% by the end of this year and my hometown of Boston, Massachusetts is expected to come online in December. So I'm very excited about that. Broadcasters are expecting to reach close to 75% or 80% of US households by the end of 2023. At the same time, the television devices, not the mobile devices, the television devices will reach a, a inflection point in sales in 2024 and are anticipated to reach maturation sales point in 2025, this according to the Consumer Technology Association. So the deployment in the United States is going along at a very good pace. At the same time, islands in the Caribbean have looked to ATSC 3.0. Jamaica is the first to announce that it will go to ATSC 3.0, and we anticipate another announcement of another island nation before the end of the year. In Jamaica already, this map is outdated. They have two transmitters live on the island now, one in Kingston, which you see in the orange area here, and one in Montego Bay. They're expecting to light up the entire nation very quickly, and they're also doing a different kind of transition because they're transitioning from analog directly to second generation digital broadcasting. In Brazil, they are working on what they're calling their TV 3.0 project which is their name for moving from a first generation digital television system to a second generation digital television system. In their case, they went through a long selection process, studying many different technologies to determine which were the best for Brazil. And so far, several technologies from the ATSC 3.0 suite of standards have been selected, including the transport system, which is the IP based system, the caption system, which is based on IMSC1, the audio system MPEG-H audio, and the advanced emergency information system from ATSC3. The physical layer testing and selection process is ongoing and will continue throughout 2023 with an expected selection in Q1 of 2024, and Brazil is expecting to launch in 2025. Interestingly, in South Korea, broadcasters were given a second broadcast band in order to simulcast the old system and the new system during the transition. In the United States, broadcasters were not given a second band to do the simulcast of the old system and the new system during the transition. And so in the US, they are employing something called channel sharing, which makes it very difficult to deploy ultra HD services because of bandwidth constraints. But hopefully when ATSC 3.0 is gradually, sun excuse me, when ATSC 1.0 is gradually sunset in the United States, we'll be able to use more and more bandwidth for 3.0 services. I mention this because in Brazil, they will face a hybrid transition. In rural areas, there is enough spectrum to transition and simulcast, whereas in urban areas, there is not. And so channel sharing will be required in Brazil in the major cities. There is additional interest in ATSC 3.0, which ATSC is working hard to support. 
First, the ideas that Seish mentioned in the earlier presentation, that India is exploring ATSC 3.0 for broadcast traffic offload and direct to mobile media services. In Canada, where they are working specifically on ATSC 3.0 and 5G convergence, they've built a B2C lab at Humber College in Toronto. And this lab is open for private and public partnership to develop ATSC 3.0 5G conversion solutions and intellectual property. They have a three site single frequency network, which they're expecting to light up this year. In Mexico, they're pursuing ATSC 3.0 equipment and regulatory permission for a pilot launch at Cinematario and Catario. This is primarily for distance education pilot. As Seish mentioned, there are certain net advantages to conserve network, uh, to converge networks. And one in particular that I would like to mention is that the characteristics of ideal broadcast use cases are where the downlink requires the same data, large data files going to many, many devices. And broadcast is the most energy efficient method of fulfilling use cases in the, with these characteristics. So as this TSDSI entire event is focused on sustainability from standards, I'd like to point out that the broadcast standard is the most energy efficient way to get a large amount of data to a large number of devices. And research is coming out on this topic to help, un, help uh, countries and commercial interests understand how much energy does it take to deliver a bit over a unicast network versus a broadcast network. And the broadcast advantages in terms of sustainability are an order of magnitude better than, I, than uh, unicast networks. So I'd like to point out that the high power, high tower infrastructure, which together with smaller cells can anchor a broadcast delivery network, it is a very valuable global resource. And that high power, high tower infrastructure should be preserved for the most sustainable path to point to multipoint data and audiovisual services. I won't dwell too much on this slide because Seish covered much of it, but there are three bullet points that I'd like to point out. The first is the physical layer, which is very flexible, configurable, and the world's most efficient D to T one-to-many system right now. The transport system is the first broadcast television transport system based on internet protocol. And the other one that I'd like to point out is the last one on evolvability. There's very clever signaling design, which enables new features to be added over time without orphaning any legacy receivers. So those are the key points that I think are lending ATSC 3.0 to 5G ATSC 3.0 convergence. There are a number of ATSC 3.0 5G convergence architectures that have been discussed either in public papers or in the hallways of conferences. And TG3, the technology group, uh, which is responsible for the ATSC 3.0 standard, formed an, a subgroup in September to focus on the potential for convergence between ATSC 3.0 and 5G. And the job of this subgroup was to document the potential solution architectures. And our hope is to be able to contribute this work into efforts that may be going on within TSDSI or 3GPP. There are a couple of architectures that I can discuss in some, at some level of detail that have been studied in this report by the ad hoc group. One is multimedia broadcast multicast service with ATSC 3.0. The solution is describing how MBMS broadcast can be supported with ATSC 3.0, in which case a new ATSC 3.0 interworking function in 3GPP parlance, we would call it the A3IWF, would be introduced in order to handle the interworking between the 3GPP EPC and the ATSC 3.0 network. So this would be for, a, um, for an LTE-based uh, convergence. A second one is the delivery of ATSC 3.0 service via LTE-based 5G broadcast and or ATSC 3.0 physical layer. So in this architecture, which was also explored, was the idea that you can actually multiplex ATSC 3.0 and FEMBMS physical layer frames in the same raster. This does require ATSC 3.0 technology to be, to be incorporated into, um, so the idea would be that the LTE uh, piece of the raster would be for the cell phones 
and the ATSC 3.0 piece of the raster would be for the fixed television services. So it would require potentially modifications to both ATSC 3 and or the 3GPP physical layer standards. It would also require simulcast of the same content in the same raster, assuming that you're trying to reach the same content to both fixed and mobile devices. And it would also kind of get rid of some of the efficiencies of ATSC 3.0 that Seish mentioned. However, it is an architecture that is being discussed and studied in ATSC 3. A third architecture that's being discuss discussed is convergence with 5G multicast broadcast services, 5G MBS. This solution allows the 5G MBS broadcast mode to be supported with ATSC 3.0. In this case, the ATSC3 transmitter together with the A3IWF would connect to the 5G new radio core in the same manner as a next generation radio access network. In other words, the access and mobility management function, the AMF, over the N2 interface for control plane functions and the multicast broadcast UPF for user plane functions would all be interworking over the N3MB. And then a fourth one, which Seish mentioned, is the ATSSS standard. Seish mentioned, I think, in quite detail what would need to change in the ATSSS standard to enable this, but the proposed architecture would describe a, quote, untrusted convergence, meaning it's a standalone ATSC 3.0 network using the quick um, UDP internet connections uh, um, protocol, which, as Seish mentioned, would need to have an update also. And the 5G core network would have an N3 interworking function, this in the N3 IWF, to handle the downlink data, leaving the broadband network. And then the interface is located at the broadcaster solutions inside the ATSC3 gateway, running the A324 studio to transmitter link communication system. All of these architectures are being studied and documented within ATSC, and the expectation is, is that this information can be provided to implementers and to other standards development organizations to assist in their work. There are a number of ATSC projects that are supporting this concept of convergence. One is ATSC Planning Team 6, which is on global recognition of ATSC 3.0, and they're drafting a white paper on the heterogeneous networks and the benefits of convergence. ATSC TG3S43, which is a specialist group on broadcast core network, is drafting the technical standards for a broadcast core network, which can incorporate and interoperate with other core networks and can be agnostic to radio access network. TG311 is the group that I just mentioned, which is working on documenting the architectures that are being discussed for 3.0 and 5G harmonization. ATSC is also actively supporting Humber College's B2C lab for ATSC 3.0 and 5G convergence. It's built for the college slash industry partnerships, developing solutions and internet intellectual property. And I'm pleased to be serving as the vice chair on their advisory committee. ATSC members are also supporting the 3GPP study item on non 3 gpp broadcast technology uh, technologies, which Seish mentioned. These are members that are in common between ATSC and uh, 3GPP. And I also want to mention and deeply thank TSDSI there is an MOU in place between our two organizations, and ATSC is very committed to supporting TSDSI's study of ATSC 3.0 for DTM and broadcast traffic offload. In summary, ATSC 3 is a commercially deployed mature technology with global interest. Broadcast and unicast technologies each play an important role in the world's growing appetite for data services. And convergence enables the best network to be used for a given data session. Consider it to be a heterogeneous network of networks that is needed, where you're choosing broadcast for the, the broadcast use cases and unicast for the unicast use cases. ATSC is currently the world's most efficient broadcast radio access technology, and there are several potential architectures for 3.0 5G interworking. Lastly, ATSC is working together with TSDSI and other STOs to promote convergence and develop technical solutions. And I highly encourage everyone to participate in these groundbreaking development opportunities. Join ATSC, TSDSI, and or 3GPP in order to make sure that your voice is heard and to contribute your ideas and technologies into these new developing and exciting systems. And with that, I'll wrap up and I encourage everybody to please use the Q&A and the chat box to talk with us 
and to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and I believe we'll be uh, doing Q&A toward the end of this session live as well. So thank you very much again to TSDSI and One Media 3.0 for this opportunity. And thank you to the audience for your kind attention. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I'm grateful for an excellent presentation. Now I would request Mr. Puneet Tathor, who is going to talk on 5G broadcast for TV, radio, IPTV, and file casting standard for convergence of broadcast and broadband. Dr. Puneet Rathod is a PhD from IIT Bombay with 17 plus years of wireless research and development experience. He has a diverse experience of working as an academic researcher, entrepreneur in public safety communication startup and more recently standardization research in multinational companies over to you sir for the keynote address three thank you uh, thank you pritam ji for this kind introduction uh, let me begin by thanking tsdsi uh, and uh, namaste and jahan everyone uh, so this is uh, 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 a great opportunity for me to share our thoughts on the 3GPP standardization efforts for 5G broadcast and also TSDSI's own technical report on this uh, topic of 5G broadcast. Uh, let me share my screen so that uh, we can uh, get uh, started. And I would request uh, the organizers to just confirm once they can uh, see my screen. Can we, uh, yes, can we see the screen? Yes, yes All right. thank you. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, so um, to begin with, um, this uh, presentation is going to dwell upon multicast and broadcast topic within 3GPP. Uh, 3GPP has been e developing standards for catering to this broadcast and multicast uh, ecosystem since a while. Uh, ever since release nine, where an operator could deploy MBMS by allocating a subset of resources to deliver broadcast content. And uh, this was the main target of this kind of technology was the traditional cellular operators to offload video content. Uh, then in release 14 onwards, 3GPP started looking at uh, further addressing the main traditional broadcasters. Uh, and, and then to this effect, uh, 3GPP developed uh, a ENTV or 5G broadcast, which is a downlink only dedicated uh, solution for the broadcasters. It leverages the cellular silicon and the cellular ecosystem uh, to, to be able to deliver uh, the broadcast. So, in, in a very short sentence, 5G broadcast or ENTV is a broadcast standard based on 3GPP ecosystem. Um, and um, on this slide, what we see is the, the TSDSI technical report, which was published uh, in April 2022 uh, on the topic of uh, service delivery using 5G broadcast for TV, radio, IPTV, file casting, uh, kind of uh, use cases. Um, the, the main use cases that we are discussing, and I think uh, in this entire session, uh, we have been talking about use cases which are typical of a traditional broadcaster, which is linear video, uh, programmed uh, television uh, broadcast content, which is one way communication to a large audience uh, on the traditionally mobile phones. Uh, in addition to this, there can be interactive media, which can combine the linear video with interactivity. And potential examples of this could be education content, which is delivered on the broadcast. And then to combine with that broadcast, 
from a converged point of view, the device could support unicast. So along with the education content, there could be interactivity. The students can ask questions, uh, attend quizzes, uh, or 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 the or it could be a uh, entertainment content, for example, sports, and then there can be unicast content coming on the unicast network as well. So so these are uh, possibilities from an interactive media point of view. Uh, in addition to this, there could be uh, national uh, importance kind of use cases, for example, emergency messages, emergency notifications to smartphones, uh, and, and uh, utilizing the resiliency of broadcast transmission in, in such cases. And finally, general, general file download. Uh, for example, uh, software or firmware upgrade to uh, a very large group of users. Uh, one common theme uh, in all of this is the end device, which is a smartphone, or if not a smartphone, a device which is capable of doing uh, 3GPP standards based 4G or a 5G modem. And, and that is what makes it uh, the ideal candidate or the main target of receiving this kind of broadcast content. And in the rest of the few slides of this presentation, uh, the idea would be to present uh, a tailor-made standard from 3GPP, which is able to leverage almost all of the 3GPP technologies that were de designed from a mobile phone uh, perspective so that uh, it is able to utilize the cellular device ecosystem without the need of any additional silicon on the on the mobile phone side. So that's where uh, uh, we we will uh, uh, we will be able to see in this presentation. The the 5G broadcast standards as a part of 3GPP are fully complete as of release 16, which was completed um, a couple of years ago. Uh, it utilizes the traditional broadcast spectrum in the UHF band. It also enables uh, a low cost deployment from a high power high tower infrastructure which is very effective to deliver broadcast content um, it can it can be uh, used for a traditional broadcaster need which is like receive only mode or a sim free operation without the need of any unicast network registration uh, it also includes uh, enablers for service layer integration so that the broadcaster content uh, can be delivered through the 5G network uh, through standardized interfaces. And then, um, like we saw in the introductory slide, uh, the 3GPP standards have been evolving on a continuous basis to add more features and uh, enable more use cases. Uh, overall, whatever we see in this slide, uh, the requirement part uh, for this started way back in release 14, which was defining the broadcast requirements uh, from a traditional broadcaster perspective, which is uh, to name a few of them, uh, uh, which is concurrent delivery of unicast and broadcast service to the users, uh, static or dynamic allocation uh, between the broadcast and unicast going all the way up 100% of the resources to be utilized by the broadcast, uh, large coverage area up to almost like 100 kilometer cell radius, ability to support high speed devices uh, and um, and the likes uh, within 3gpp the the way 3gpp works is over the last few years 3gpp has started catering to ecosystem which go well beyond the the traditional smartphone or just a mobile phone kind of usage and there are multiple examples of this. Uh, there is public safety, there is automotive, there is satellite, uh, IoT. Uh, so 3GPP has been uh, attracting ecosystem from multiple non-mobile uh, users for a while now. And this is one of those uh, cases where in release 16, when the work started within 3GPP for ENTV, the, the work was championed by traditional broadcasters of the world, for example, BBC, European Broadcasting Union, 
dish network uh, and uh, uh, and the likes and when this release 16 standard for 5g broadcast was complete as normal course of action within 3gpp they started looking at adding further enhancements and one of those enhancements was supporting the traditional broadcast channel bandwidths of five of six seven and eight megahertz and again when this uh, work started in release 17 uh, this was uh, this was along with the traditional 3gpp players it had support from uh, all the traditional players like broadcasting union we have one media we have sankhya labs we have iit bombay the the entire ecosystem uh, which can utilize and can benefit from uh, this uh, 3gpp standardized work was uh, was was part of uh, this effort within 3gpp to deliver broadcast content uh, directly to a mobile phone um, so this is um, in the next few slides i'm just uh, going to go through uh, some uh, some details of uh, what is captured inside the tsdsi technical report for this 5g broadcast system and in this slide, what we have is a is an overall reference architecture for a 5G broadcast subsystem. Uh, on the on the up uh, on the above part of this diagram is is mostly the application layer, which is what we would be having uh, uh, on on our smartphone or on the right side on the content provider side, and whatever is here in the box below is the entire 5G broadcast system. Uh, the the 3GPP standard also captured within the TSDSI technical report is this standardized interface XMB. So a traditional content provider, a, a broadcast provider or a radio provider could have their content in their own format, in their own con content encoding templates, packaging and, and, and the likes. And they can deliver this through the standardized interface XMB to the 5G core network. And uh, on the on the other side, from the core network, there are the standardized interfaces M1 and M3, which are the reference points between the core and the radio network of the uh, of the 3GPP network, which can then deliver this content to the mobile phone. Uh, and then on the mobile phone end, uh, at the application layer, this can get received in a in just a software app which is uh, designed by the uh, by the broadcast provider uh, and it, this could just be a wrapper which says that uh, uh, it could have a simple application which will allow changing the channels or um, or watching the program guide and then selecting what to watch um, one of the one of the main advantages of this uh, of utilizing this kind of a 3gpp solution would be uh, convergence comes natively um, and what this means is uh, a 5g broadcast transmitter can transmit to a 5g broadcast receiver as a completely standalone network so there is no involvement of any operator or any licensed vendor it is receive only mode it can support sim free operation and it can deliver free to air kind of content. Uh, in addition to this, this can also support this broadcast transmitter delivering to the mobile phone, which is capable of doing both the broadcast receive as well as the traditional 4G or 5G connectivity. And then this can uh, start supporting all the other advanced use cases like interactive uh, uh, content in addition to uh, in in parallel to receiving the broadcast content um, and and one more um, further enhancement to this would be uh, that the unicast network may not just be an add-on for uh, doing interactive content or quiz or whatever it could also be utilized to enhance the broadcast experience for example file repair procedures so uh, if there are packet drops on the broadcast uh, delivery then the unicast could be utilized to uh, to enhance those uh, uh, services 
and uh, and and that that could be one of those uh, examples as well. Um, so um, from uh, from the standards, there are uh, there are multiple three GPP specifications which uh, define the 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 device, uh, the receiver requirements, the the transmitter related requirements, which are spread across multiple 3GPP documents uh, from the 5G physical layer. Uh, these are also then summarized as a device profile, uh, the, the receiver profile and others in the HC uh, standard. And the TSDSI standard here, uh, the technical report also captures uh, um, like a like a deployment guide on how such a content can be uh, how such a network can be de designed and deployed. Uh, so this is the overall uh, standardization uh, effort towards this, and all of these are uh, fully standardized. And from the timeline, it is visible that the the entire standardization effort uh, within 3GPP and HC was complete way back in 2020. And then uh, the deployment uh, uh, guide and technical report completed within TSDSI in 2022. Um, uh, just a quick uh, uh, reference to what we uh, what we saw of uh, this 5G broadcast. So whatever we uh, whatever we were able to document within the TSDSI technical report, uh, we were also able to bring uh, to to India in the recently concluded India Mobile Congress, and I think um, we, um, I was discussing with uh, uh, Vijay Madanji, uh, who who is also the advisor of the study group uh, Services and Solutions (SGSS), and um, and when I invited him over to the to the Qualcomm area, and and I would I would quote him, which is uh, this was truly standards to practice what we were able to see uh, inside uh, the in, in the in the demo uh, I, i'll not go much into detail in this probably this is a, a brief snapshot of all the uh, global uh, uh, deployments and trials for 5g broadcast we work very closely with rodi and schwartz uh, we started uh, a first demo of this uh, uh, in MWC in Barcelona, and um, what we have is um, it was it was it would show a broadcast transmitter in the broadcast spectrum without a SIM card on a traditional smartphone uh, without any additional silicon. So that is what uh, was the uh, was demonstrated, and this is what we were able to bring to uh, to the India Mobile Congress in October 2022 where uh, we showed uh, this entire uh, setup operating in the UHF band with free to wear sim free operation and no additional silicon inside the smartphone uh, which is truly the biggest strength of uh, the solution where uh, the moment we talk about uh, delivering this broadcast content to 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 large uh, masses on the mobile phone and in an, in an extremely cost sensitive market like india uh, this is able to leverage the entire physical layer which is designed inside 3gpp uh, and 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 a few additional features which were part of the demonstration uh, are listed here this is also something which is also discussed inside the uh, technical report of tsdsi which is uh, augmenting the broadcast with uh, file download text uh, messages emergency emergency broadcast uh, messages as well uh, so in terms of the uh, capabilities what does it mean to uh, to to have this broadcast broadband convergence uh, uh, there are enormous commonalities between the standards based ecosystem of what a traditional cellular unicast device modem can do and what what is required to be done to receive this 5g broadcast on a mobile phone it is able to reuse uh, major building blocks and almost all the building blocks for uh, for 4g and 5g from coding tone mapping searcher mapper uh, uh, within the modem itself so this is what 
is able to uh, enable uh, smartphones to support 5G broadcast very easily. Um, the convergence comes natively because all of these are part of the 3GPP standards family. Um, it makes uh, a life easier and straightforward for the broadcasters so that their content formats uh, and the formats which are desired by the broadcasters are supported and through standardized interfaces uh, to the 5G core network. So CMAF, Dash SLS, uh, they can be deployed with 5G broadcast or on top of 5G broadcast. And overall, this makes it a standards-based ecosystem uh, uh, so that the, the barrier to entry or uh, the adoption is faster. Uh, and 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 the last but one slide before I conclude my presentation is is on the emergency notifications, which is uh, which is something uh, extremely important and and very crucial uh, from from uh, from multiple uh, country point of view and including uh, a country like India. And when we have um, say a national calamity, uh, say a flood or a cyclone, the the cellular networks, which are the traditional uh, smaller, uh, even a macro cell, they are covering a range of approximately a, a kilometer or or less than that. So the cellular networks may get affected much faster, but the broadcast, the high power, high tower infra is 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 something which continues to remain available. Now, if uh, the technology utilized is the same 3GPP based technology, uh, what all of us would be aware of is if we receive 3GPP solution, 3GPP technology enables receiving text based emergency alert messages. And if I am a mobile phone user and if my if I don't have a SIM card, if I'm within the coverage of even a single cellular operator, if that operator is broadcasting such text based emergency alert messages, I can receive them. In this case, the beauty of this would be that if there is a 5G broadcast tower, a high power, high tower tower at the edge of the city, if the entire uh, city cellular infra is affected, but this tower is alive, a text based message can be received on the mobile phones uh, using the 3GPP standards based uh, messaging uh, uh, framework. And, uh, and and to enhance the whole experience, there can be a hyperlink within the message to deliver, uh, say, a multimedia uh, or audio video content to, to further improve uh, the use utility of such a broad uh, emergency message. Um, so, so that's uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, what what I wanted to show in terms of the uh, possibilities that. Uh, are possible using 5G broadcast, and uh, and and finally, as a as as a pointer to what is happening in the international standards related to 5G broadcast, uh, ITUR Working Party 6A is now in the process of revising their broadcast recommendations, and this LTE-based 5G broadcast is is part of those recommendations as a broadcasting technology, and uh, to deliver broadcast for the terrestrial broadcast systems and uh, itur working body 5b is de de is uh, is developing a report on multimedia capturing various imt technologies that can deliver audio visual and uh, graphics supporting real time multimedia again lt based 5g broadcast is part of this report as well um, so with this i would uh, conclude my presentation and um, once again thank you to TSDSI and thank you to the audience for 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 this opportunity to share thoughts about this TSDSI work on 5G broadcast. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Puneet Rathod, for an excellent presentation. Now we would request Mr. Vinay Srivastava for the keynote address four. That is. The topic he will speak on a 3GPP perspective on multicast and broadcast communication.
Mr. Vinay Kumar Srivastava received his master's degree in telecommunication systems engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in 2003, and a bachelor's degree in electronics engineering from Rajiv Gandhi Pradyukiki Vishwavidyalaya, India, in 2001. He joined Samsung Electronics in 2003. and he has worked extensively on design and development of 3g 4g and 5g modem with this i would hand over to mr vinay kumar srivastava for the keynote number 4 over to you sir It is a privilege to be on this session on broadcast and broadband convergence. My name is Vinay Srivastava. I work with Samsung India and participate to 3GPP standardization in the RAN2 working group. Today I will present a 3GPP perspective on the evolution of multicast and broadcast communication. Exponential growth of mobile traffic largely due to video based services has been well anticipated. As a response, 3GPP considered multicast and broadcast communication with the resource-efficient point-to-multipoint service delivery that can help to alleviate the ever-increasing burden on broadband network resources. This also led to more than a decade-long standardization effort in 3GPP to develop different features of multicast and broadcast communication. As we will discuss, they are spread across many releases of 4G and 5G wireless standards. While doing all this. Broadcast and broadband convergence has been a key aspect of 3GP design framework and has been emphasized in the evolution of multicast and broadcast. MBMS in release 9 marked the beginning of broadcast communication in 4G LTE standards. This provided multi-cell transmission with large coverage areas. Single frequency network with synchronized nodes enables over the air combining of broadcast signals. idea is to reinforce the signal strength and enhance the coverage obviously transmission and contents must be synchronized while broadcast and unicast transmission from broadband network are distributed in a fixed time interleaved manner entire system bandwidth is also utilized alternatively among broadcast and broadband this provides high data rate capacity but it comes at the cost of flexibility of operation With a few more enhancements in further releases, the major advancement was with GCSE in release 12, which provided system enablers for the group communication. The main use cases targeted were for public safety and mission critical push to talk services, supporting first responders and security personnel. The group communication framework also supports for congestion mitigation and service migration across unicast and group communication delivery modes. Single cell point to multi point SCPTM in release 13 overcome some of the shortcomings of EMVMS. SCPTM had some enhancement over EMVMS with a more flexible use of time frequency resources among broadband unicast and broadcast as and when they are required, and also focusing on the small dense areas like hot spot. Also, it is more tightly integrated with broadband by providing multicast service delivery through unicast physical channels with further enhanced mbms in release 1415 focus shifted to providing enhanced television services through 3gpp based distribution system some of the important features include free to air or receive only mode services which do not need operator subscription that is that it can also be operated uh, sim free more flexible use of network resources is allowing up to 100% usage for broadcast as well as a uh, uh, mixed use for unicast and broadcast single rf and multi rf devices both can be supported uh, and broadband and broadcast could also be from two different networks or operators which may share the mbms services terrestrial broadcast utilizes dedicated broadcast infra with high power high tower deployments providing uh, broadcast only and downing only transmissions Uh, with the large coverage areas lte based terrestrial broadcast was further improvised in release 16 based on the gap analysis study for 5g and uh, it is targeted to address even larger and static transmission areas uh, 
more than 100 kilometers and better mobility support for devices. This was largely achieved with the introduction of extended numerologies of 0.37 kilohertz and 2.5 kilohertz. Coming to 5G MBS, natural adoption of multicast and broadcast for 5G was quite expected. Also, 5G is required to overcome the drawbacks, especially on the reliability aspects or higher capex and the commercial unsuccess of the 4G based multicast and broadband. Though a bit late, 5G based MBS feature is introduced in release 17 and its standardization is very recently completed. We can notice 5G MBS has set much higher benchmark in terms of the objectives as compared to what was there in 4G. These objectives include support for both point to point and point to multi point and also dynamic switching among them. Group scheduling mechanisms which allows for simultaneous operation with unicast reception. Increased reliability with uh, uplink feedback to support even ultra reliable and critical services. Service continuity which needs to be seamless and lossless even in the mobility scenarios. MBS reception uh, also over the legacy nodes which may not support the MBS feature. Having set the objectives, now we will delve into more details of 5G MBS in terms of architectural enhancement, protocol design and physical air aspects that will help fulfill the service requirements. On the service requirements uh, with a variety of services to be supported, they are uh, obviously new and demanding uh, set of service requirements. Uh, for simplicity, we may categorize them into four quadrants as shown in the figure. And uh, namely, they are coverage, reliability and quality of service, service continuity and security. On the coverage aspect, uh, services do differ in terms of their coverage requirement. Some of the services could be nationwide, some may require local coverage. And uh, to ensure that this variable range of coverage is important from MBS perspective. Reliability also differ for services. Some of the services like mission critical delay sensitive services may be very uh, extreme cases of low latency and high reliability. Service continuity is also crucial for seamless and lossless reception along with mobility. At the same time, continuity should also extend across legacy network nodes. Security for access credentials and MBS data authenticity and integrity is important. It is also realized the security mechanisms should be transparent to radio access network will lead to more deployment flexibility to operators and same principle has been adopted in 5G MBS. Now we'll discuss on the architectural enhancement for 5G MBS. The basic principle for 5G MBS network architecture is to maximally reuse existing network entities as much as possible with software upgrades. Therefore, the existing entities like SMF, user session management function or UPF, user plan function and MF can be largely reused with uh, some enhancements. In some cases, some new and upgraded entities like MB UPF and uh, MB SMF which are uh, introduced to support uh, MBMS operation can still be co-located with the existing entities. Broadly, two mechanisms of shared delivery and individual delivery are supported. While shared delivery allows to distribute the same packet to multiple UEs, individual delivery is also needed to support dedicated packet delivery to each UE. This is more particularly used when non-MBS capable RAN nodes are involved in the communication. Now considering some protocol enhancement for 5G MBS, if we look at this uh, figure, we can note that 5G MBS protocol stake is quite involved and is almost at par with the that of Unicast. Support is added for MBS radio bearers and uh, channels to enable point to point and point to multi point and also potentially their combinations. It allows uh, switching across Unicast and uh, point to point and point to multi point modes with suitable reconfiguration of radio bearers and radio resources. For enhanced power saving for the devices, there is support for discontinuous reception for broadcast as well as for multicast. 
Mapping between QS flows and MBS attributors is also supported. Based on the reliability need, both unacknowledged and acknowledged mode of data transfer are uh, enabled. Header compression is supported for data efficiency. Considering the physical layer enhancement for 5G MS, uh, we can notice there are significant enhancement and uh, MBS transmissions uh, are nicely integrated in, into 5G bandwidth part BAS framework. Fast uplink feedback by UEs to enable reliability approaches where enhanced reliability can be achieved with a variety of ways. It could be switching between point-to-point uh, -point to point-to-multipoint or there are multiple ways of retransmissions through layer 1 or layer 2 based uh, techniques which includes uh, ARQ or, or hybrid ARQ bundling repetitions kind of approaches and many of times they can also be applied together based on the requirement. Further design for linear repetition for unicast physical channel is reused for MBS which causes less implementation impact and maintain high performance. Focusing more on the service continuity challenges, so 5G MBS is a higher benchmark in terms of supporting lossless service continuity and it and is also quite at par with performance achievable with Unicast. More particularly, some of the mechanisms which are uh, provided to enable this Lossless service continuity include data forwarding of MBS data across RAN nodes, transitions across service delivery modes during mobility, for example, based on RAN node capability and service requirements. In order to support retransmission and combining of MBS data coming from different nodes, it is ensured that there is a packet level uh, sequence number synchronization over the coverage area. So release 17 provided basic functions to support MBS. Now it is required to enable better deployment of MBS. So enhance MBS uh, is a recently started release at in work item in 5G Advance and is focused on enhancing the operational efficiency and capacity improvement for MBS deployments. Targeted completion is by December 2023. There are three main focus areas. First one is the scalability to support more users for MBS services. There are limitations on number of UEs which can be uh, active at a time. That means number of active connections are limited. So enhancing access of multicast services to more users implies that multicast can also be received by UEs when they are in RC inactive state. Secondly, coexistence between broadcast and unicast is also important. And it is a common practice that hardware processing resources are shared for broadcast and unicast in the UE implementation and this may cause restrictions on the simultaneous operations. Assistance information from the UE can facilitate better network configuration to support coexistence. Third is the resource efficiency, especially in the RAN sharing scenarios. RAN sharing among operators is cost-effective approach for networks to reduce capex and is quite practically deployed. Objective is that MBS transmission resources need also be effectively utilized in RAN sharing scenarios among multiple operators. Lastly, we focus on the uh, convergence issues and as we discuss, broadcast and broadband convergence has been the core idea in 3GPP and each of the MBS features targeted this with uh, some innovative solutions uh, like uh, utilizing time frequency resources distribution either in a fixed and flexible manner as in the SCPTM for FEMBMS, deploying dedicated carriers or switching across different delivery modes as was uh, added in 5G MBS. So these approaches were mostly physical air based and they were well defined within the 3GPP framework. So another emerging direction for convergence is the usage of non-3GPP broadcasting systems along with 5G cellular broadband to support MBS services. This is well reflected with the service requirements for interworking between 5 MBS and non 3GPP broadcast as they are already available in 3GP release 19. Stage 2 discussions are expected to commence in quarter 2 of 2023. We need to see how this works out. While we, we can recognize there are many challenges uh, from the technical challenge perspective, 
convergence at each layer of what are the resource allocation strategies, the need for standardized interfaces are some of the important issues to settle. From business challenge perspective, also support from network operators, broadcasters and content providers is quite crucial. Convergence is required to benefit both the operators and users and they should find it attractive. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for this opportunity to present my views. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar Sirvastav, for an excellent presentation. Now, I would request Mr. Mohammad Aziz Taga as a speaker on Keynote 5, he will speak on 5G broadcast when broadcast natively meet broadband. Mohammad Aziz Saga takes care of product management for 5G media services, including 5G broadcast, oblique multicast within Rode and Swerd, Monit in Germany. Mohammed leads as well the 5G media global business development activity and worldwide associated projects. Mr. Mohammed Aziz constantly monitors associated market movements and related technological progress, aiming at providing guidance towards overall product and solution strategy. Over to Mr. Mohammed Aziz Daga for the next text. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, you I are. Will, I will share my screen quickly with you. Um, I would like to, first of all, thanks TSDSI for the kind invitation to the technical um, dive session for me for the first time. Um, and today I will focus a bit on a specific um, technology uh, when broadcast natively meets broadband. Um, I would also like to thank all the colleagues who already presented um, the different concept ranging from ATSC3, 5G broadcast LTE based, 5 MBS. And um, now it's time to also focus a bit on, on, on what it is happening around the world and the technology that um, is also um, addressing multiple um, challenges and addressing uh, multiple interests uh, from different uh, angles, both technological angles and business angles. So um, I have a couple of slides that are prepared here where I will start basically um, to address the broadcast trends in general, um, Roden Schwartz's role in, the, in this industry in general, and then step by step go into uh, 5G broadcast and see the different use cases and technical solutions before making a closing um, uh, about the global footprint. So um, I would like to first of all address a point which is very important here, which is the challenges within the industry. If we look into the broadcasting industry, um, all of this started um, some years ago with a challenge coming from broadcast environment and broadcast industry, but this challenge has been step by step adopted also by different other industries so that we are talking right now about more or less a cross industrial challenge that addresses multiple stakeholders and um, at least the main stakeholders or locomotive behind of this technology would be mobile um, operators, um, broadcast operators or broadcasters in general, including content owners and exclusive content providers as well. So that's why at least these three elements are important to um, cover uh, this uh, slide concerning the industry challenges. And looking into the challenges in general, this is a accumulation, a kind of snowball around since a couple of years right now that started from the broadcast industry from multiple countries where the consumers change their behavior from TV reception and consuming uh, content at home into mobile reception and consuming 
the reception on the go, where streaming services became much more important than broadcast service in the normal linear TV is losing much more popularity than it was 10 years ago. And from the other side, this is also an, an important effect for the broadcasters since they are um, kind of threatened, but also they are not uh, losing hope, but they are looking into new business to business opportunities. Um, from the right hand side, mobile operators also are looking always into increasing um, the quality of experience uh, of their subscribers so that the latter could stay longer in the network and then generate much more business. But the, the quality of service and quality of experience, specifically when it comes to um, mobile video mobile um, reception, is sometimes uh, and adults. That's why also mobile operators around the world who are focusing on media and entertainment distribution, uh, either on demand or live, um, are also having their own challenges seen from their own end. Now comes the third player who are the content owners or content providers who are looking into, of course, reducing their distribution costs, uh, trying to uh, avoid using content delivery networks much more. And from the other side, also, they are looking into reaching wider audience with the lowest cost possible while using a reliable and flexible distribution system um, that could, of course, complement the existing cellular system. And here, the content owners or content providers are not only the traditional ones who are the public broadcasters or private content owners like sports content owners, but also new content owners are jumping in that are um, working in the commerce domain or they are working also in the, in the automotive domain where they are also playing a role uh, into the overall um, ecosystem. So the idea from our perspective is to try to find out a way to efficiently deliver content or media in general anywhere, anytime and to everybody. So the content uh, can be delivered using broadcast unicast, uh, broadcast multicast in addition to unicast at the same time to, to address the EMBB angle, the enhanced mobile broadband angle. And technically speaking, this can be, of course, deployed uh, via several options. This, you can focus on high power, high tower, as I heard earlier. You can also focus on the cellular side. So there is a hybrid mode in between that you can find a way in order to have the perfect match, the perfect coverage, and the perfect service that you could provide to your subscribers. But also independent of the, of the technical side of things, important is to look into the overall economical impacts and the readiness of the ecosystem whether to deploy this or not, and uh, what, he, what are the win-to-win -win situations, and where are these win-to-win -win situations, and then address them concretely. So uh, let me step back a bit. In Once we look into the digital dividend, um, TV distribution in general, let me make it simple, started from nowhere, from analog. Then step by step, it moved into digital, and with digital distribution, we had different services and different technologies that were in place. But 15 years ago, as well, um, the idea of distributing and receiving the content over mobile devices was there. So this is nothing really new. But back then, um, these two technologies, DVBH and MediaFlow, did not fly due to many reasons. Maybe not technically uh, speaking, the problem was coming from that angle, but more in the relation of adapting such a system in the ecosystem and the readiness of, um, of the mobile devices, the readiness of the subscriber or the mobile user's behavior was quite different 15 years ago than it is right now. That's why both technologies were kind of obsolete at the end of the day. But then this pushed us always into looking into the future as a native um, way of thinking, what could be the next? And if we look into the potential for terrestrial broadcast system in general, there is a multitude of perfect candidates on the table, ranging from ATSC3, which is a mature technology already deployed in multiple countries, as mentioned before, Korea, US, Jamaica is on the way, uh, a proven technology that is commercialized, the mature one. Then step by step, we look into a other technologies that are also alternatives coming from different countries. So DTMB coming from China or advanced ISDBT coming from Japan still on the lab phases. But all of these technologies are really very promising because um, together with 5G broadcast, they are addressing the same goal, the next generation broadcast system, both 
with the best quality, but also addressing different types of receivers. So not only uh, receiving via rooftop at home, but also mobile in a more dynamic way. And then, as I said, these different technologies, maybe 5G broadcast is the less mature one out of all of these, but all of these technologies are on the table and could be basically deployed because they are also, majority of them are also uh, internationally recognized. So once we look into the, this picture exactly, we need to also ask ourselves um, if, the if the technical, minimum technical requirements are met, yes or no. And if it is yes, then the next question would be, what is the market readiness towards these technologies in a concrete deployment perspective? And whether the, the deployment perspective is easy or not, and what are the challenges? So if we focus on 5G broadcast, um, it's a mixture between mobile and broadband natively, as I said, between broadcast and mobile, sorry, natively, as I said, because it make, makes a mixture between broadcast and mobility, 5G, even though the physical layer is LTE Advanced Pro, so the correct technical term is LTE-based 5G terrestrial broadcast system, but tailored into 5G broadcast. And there are two variants, just to make sure that we do not mix up both. There is the LTE-based, which is a terrestrial-based um, solution, broadcast solution, that can be deployed by broadcasters worldwide. And um, NR Multicast or 5MBS, um, that is a cellular oriented, a, a, a successor of the old EMBMS from LTE over NR in, the, in a mixed mode, so to speak. And from a um, standard perspective, um, the first appearance of LTE based was in release 14, was not mature enough from a standard perspective. That's why we have chosen to address additional gap analysis in release 16 and then release 17 to address six seven and eight megahertz thruster and at the same time release 17 uh, 5 mbs also um, took place and uh, has been already standardized in release 17 and it is also uh, about to be enhanced in the future so this is an evolving standard in general whether we talk about terrestrial broadcast 5g broadcast or the normal cellular 5g broadcast um, the, the technical features in a nutshell here would not focus too much um, due to the time constraint here, but nevertheless, the point that are really important to highlight are mainly we talk about a similar reception that is uh, simplifying the way of doing business, even for mobile operators who are, um, historically speaking, tied up with the fact of I need a SIM card, um, I need a SIM subscription to, to, to monetize this. Even with seamless reception, the monetization is possible via an application. So a mobile operator can provide such a service not only to their subscribers, but to also to everybody in the country uh, and do not tie up their subscribers or who is interested to get the service exclusively from them via purchasing a SIM card and then throwing it away. That's uh, in increasing the flexibility also from, from the mobile operator's perspective, but also from broadcaster's perspective. It's indeed uh, a key um, feature in order to distribute and to implement such a service using their terrestrial broadcast infrastructure. It can work in receive only mode and FTA, that means free to air, but it can be also coupled with an uplink because usually if you use your normal smartphone, all the smartphones are equipped with a SIM card, so automatically you will have an uplink and return channel to make your broadcast system much more interactive. And here also a natively implemented feature. Um, in spectrum options, there are many. Um, if it is a broadcast system, then broadcast operators could deploy this in UHF band. If mobile operators are interested in this, there are also other options like SD advanced, depending on the regions. But at the end of the day, when it comes to broadcast deployment, um, there are multiple um, possibilities, ranging from high power to medium power to low power, which is similar to the E-Node B, of course, depending on the environment, depending on, on the propagation model, depending on on the scenario, the use case in, in as such, are we talking about a private network? Are we talking about nationwide? Are we talking about rural area or a suburban area or urban dense area? So different perspective and different possibilities with also different velocities ranging from rooftop reception to a high speed reception, theoretically speaking, reaching 250 kilometers per hour. And from a uh, dimensioning perspective, this works in both SFN, MFN, can be at the same time also SFN and MFN, depending on the orchestration layer. 
On a global specs perspective, um, this has been also highlighted by some colleagues before, technology as such has been already touched by multiple standardization parties. Firstly, through GPP in 2017, then ITU adopted it in Working Party 6A and TG61 towards WRC23, so it's a preparation for Region 1, um, WRC23. And at the same time, as I said in the beginning, 3GP is evolutive. So release 16 was there, release 17, and it's a release independent in release 18 right now with around four. Uh, it's also ongoing in order to define new bands. Uh, in the meantime, Etsy also decided to adopt such a system as a European broadcast system, but ITU in the meantime um, has been uh, working on endorsing it as a technology to become a worldwide standard from a regulatory perspective. So sometimes I hear why exactly 5G broadcast and not any other technology. Of course, there are multiple arguments that could be put on table, but there are selective things when it comes to terrestrial broadcast system in general, independent whether 5G broadcast or not. We talk about a robustness of a, of a system that is terrestrial based, uh, mm. that has a certain reliability proven since decades, not not now. And we talk about an efficiency, not only from a spectrum perspective, not only even from an energy perspective, but from a total cost of ownership. The number of sites, as a simple example, the number of sites that would be needed to be deployed for 5G broadcast are even less than 5% needed for a cellular model using a certain frequency band like UHF band. And the overall um, system in general is easy to maintain because uh, it's a consequence um, to, uh, to a total cost of ownership. Um, but once mixing 5G with broadcast, it adds another element, spices on top, which is the security and the flexibility that is not there for the legacy broadcast system. And that's really a good match that makes the overall, um, the overall system and the overall technology much more reliable and really elastic. But also looking into a terrestrial broadcast system, it does not only mean a wider reach, a nationwide deployment, but also a green solution with a lower carbon footprint. From a use case perspective, there are multitude and many of them has been already mentioned before. This ranges from live casting, which is live and linear content distribution uh, into a um, file-based distribution like over-the-air multicast software updates, also inside different types of, um, of receivers like vehicles. Um, but also there are emerging market, emerging applications that we could see right now step by step. This includes the venue casting. So for instance, taking a certain private network of venue uh, or even a square uh, where you can, uh, where you can put and enhance the customer experience and the, 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 the fans experience, so to speak, inside that venue, bringing multi-angle streaming, um, bringing additional advertisement um, capabilities and also additional, um, additional business opportunities on an event basis. So you have, for example, a, a limited event in time and in location where you can uh, switch on the broadcast mode and then switch it off just for that event, which is bringing it in a kind of a portable way where you can have a portable infrastructure, you put it there and then you can even reuse it later on for another venue. But also other applications like uh, PNT, positioning, navigation and timing. So the situation in Europe, for instance, pushed uh, some stakeholders to look into a backup system to GNSS um, to become much more independent of um, GNSS and to increase and to focus more on the sovereignty of the countries. That's why a positioning navigation on time specifically for Europe is also a topic um, and a potential feature for 5G broadcast, which is still under um, R&D topic. Um, so I will skip this because this talks about uh, vehicle casting. So we talk about distributing video and audio inside the car in the self-driven cars in the future. Um, this is also applicable uh, into um, the self-driven cars and the intelligent um, uh, cockpit system in the future, how it could look like, um, that you can get information in a broadcast mode when you are in, inside your car. This includes uh, nearby information, includes the advertisement possibilities and so on. Another use case, which is uh, also, I think, highlighted earlier in relation to public safety, um, public safety is also an important topic um, when it comes to governmental support and 
public service in general and that the citizens are having the right to get their information on time and accurate as much as accurate as possible so 5g broadcast is also playing the role here to bring uh to your own pocket at any time and any location even inside when you are in the mountains or when you are in the area where you are deprived from the cellular network you get the information about something which is happening and then you keep you informed about any um emergency case and being alerted and being ready for that um another use case i was uh, mentioning before is a um, venue based uh, distribution for broadcast multicast a typical example of this is a vista project standing for venue in stadium architecture this has been done project has been elaborated with multiple stakeholders in the uk um, where we at the end of the day figured out that there are a lot of potential features um, using such a broadcast system in a localized area this includes advertisement and sales opportunity directly to your pocket um, and getting the information about the relevance um, about the, 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 the stadium uh, at the same time. Or if you are part of part of that fun experience, then you get multi-angle streaming, like it is mentioned here. For example, on the left-hand side, you get six HD streams. When you are sitting um, in your seat, um, you, can, you can feel uh, exactly like you are part of a game, uh, but you can also follow up other games that are going on at the same time and feel like you are synchronized not only in the place where this is happening but also in other locations to feel to keep you always informed and increase your experience while you are inside the venue. Um, to get further information about Vista, this is a public uh, project that we did in the UK. Um, you can get a sustainability report that talks about the business utilizability and the, the business uh, side of, of it, how it could be deployed uh, and what are the, the benefits and potential challenges that we need to be uh, considered when it comes to venue um, distribution or venue based broadcast system. So a, from a high level technical perspective, um, we think that um, the broadcast solution, uh, 5G broadcast solution can be deployed um, firstly and foremostly for rural and suburban area using this high power or medium power system that are in place that are covering a huge area, easily 60, 70 kilometers of radius. Um, however, when it comes to a dense ur urban area, then that might be challenging and the current high power system which is in place either in the city or on the edge of the city might not be suitable into covering the overall urban dense area where a additional uh, small broadcast stations needs to be placed into um, selected cells in order to make small overlay on top of the existing cells like E node Bs and G node Bs. And that is uh, here covered in the solution two, where we believe that solution one and solution two together would be a perfect fit for all the different areas, ranging from rural areas down to the dense urban area for a continuous coverage, of course. So uh, the first time 5G broadcast was live and um, demoed together with the stakeholders, including uh, Qualcomm, who was during the Congress. Uh, um, Hello, sir. Okay. Yes. My I would request you, sir, since you're uh, over so few time, may I request you to... Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Just give me two minutes. So uh, I will just uh, talk about the, 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 the system that has been demoed in Mobile World Congress and um, in different other areas. This has been also highlighted before. Um, so the infrastructure as such is including the building blocks um, according to 3GPP specs. In general, um, a 5G broadcast system is natively um, also applicable and implementable on the 5G receiver side because um, uh, it includes the building blocks, necessary building blocks, and only some of the pieces that are missing in comparison to non 3 gpp broadcast network um, a legacy system in place. And to finish, uh, so this is the um, significant interest towards 5G broadcast worldwide, where um, we have a couple of trials that are already ranging from a lab uh, system into a field trials. This is mainly covered in Europe, um, in China, um, also in, in Latin America, um, but step by step, we could see that the interest is coming from other countries, as it is mentioned in this landscape. With this, I finish my slides. Thanks a lot for your patience and thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much.
sir, for your nice presentation. Now uh, we would request um, Mr. Prashant Maru for the keynote six. This is direct to mobile broadcast broadband convergence. Mr. Prashant Maru has 26 plus years of experience in the field of telecommunication in leadership roles in various telecom vendor organizations. He worked with Ericsson for 20 years before moving to ZTE and then to Sancha Lab. He has been in the sales and business development role during the last 14 plus years. Over these years, he has gradually evolved from various leadership roles like engineering, R&D, system integration, P&V, project public program management, and finally in his current role, in sales and business development. Over to Mr. Prashant Maru. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vishnoi. Uh, I have a recorded presentation as well. Um, so um, I'm, I'm guessing uh, Jaskirat will uh, start the recording. Thank you. OK, sir. Yes, sir. Jaskirat, uh, please do the needful. Namaste, everyone. Uh, my name is Prashant Maru from Sankhya Labs, and today I'm going to be speaking about uh, direct-to-mobile broadcast uh, broadband convergence. Um, but before that, I'd like to thank uh, TSDSI for giving me the opportunity to speak about D2M convergence at uh, TTDD 2022 uh, Convergence Seminar. Uh, let me share my screen and start the presentation. So please bear with me for a moment. So uh, once again, I'll be talking about uh, D2M broadcast broadband convergence at TTDD 2022 conference. Uh, why D2M? What is the need? What is the motivation? Uh, why should we invest time, money, and our efforts into doing this? Um, data consumption, as we have seen over several years, is uh, exponentially increasing, uh, specifically the video data consumption. Um, we are also seeing since the latter part of 2019 that the cost of uh, the unicast bit is consistently increasing. And uh, every indicator is telling us that it will continue to increase. Um, it used to be, the R2 used to be around 110, maybe 120 rupees uh, in December 2019. Today it is uh, 200 plus, almost 250 rupees. And uh, every indication is telling us that it will continue to increase. Um, in India today, we have roughly about 210 uh, TV households. And in comparison to that, we have about uh, 1149 million mobile subscribers. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that we utilize uh, not just the TV, screens, but also the mobile screens to receive broadcasted content. I mean, why should we restrict uh, broadcast content just to 210 screen? Why not uh, utilize this 1 billion plus screen, which is almost 5.5 times the number of TV households? So that's a huge number, a huge market that we can target for uh, receiving broadcast content. Moreover, the cost of broadcast bit versus the cost of unicast bit. You know, um, I'll, I'll dive a little deeper into that particular uh, statement that I just made. Uh, it costs about 68 cents uh, for uh, one GB of data over a typical uh, mobile network. And in comparison to that, it can cost um, uh, less than, uh, it can cost uh, less than one tenth of a cent uh, for transmitting one GB of data over a terrestrial broadcast network. Um, why the huge difference? I mean, at on one hand, we are talking about 68 cents. At the other end, we are talking about less than one tenth of a cent. I mean, uh, it's huge. The difference is just phenomenally huge. Um, why? Uh, one of the reasons is if you look at a typical operator in India to cover the entire length and breadth of uh, a country the size of India, we would require about 350,000 towers to create a max capacity of about 400 crore GB per month. To create a similar capacity of around 450 crore GB per month using broadcast, 
we would require less than one tenth the number of towers, one tenth the number of sites that would be required as compared to um, uh, the mobile network. <clears throat> uh, a typical unicast mobile network topology in India or anywhere in the world for that matter is we have <coughs> operator A, operator B, and operator C, each one of them having their own individual RAN network and their own individual core networks. Um, the problem with such a network is as you try and increase the number of subscribers that you want to support, as you try and increase the uh, throughputs uh, through your uh, radio access network, um, each of these operators would require to densify their uh, radio access network. And uh, if you don't do that, you run into problems of capacity constraints. So uh, when you increase an, uh, the number of radio access network elements, you increase the capacity, but along with that, you increase your capex and operational expense. Uh, similarly, at the core, uh, you, increase, uh, you increase your cost of the core network uh, as you try to increase the capacities through the mobile network. Uh, what we are proposing uh, is a converged broadcast broadband network where uh, the receivers are essentially converged receivers in different form factors. Uh, the uh, radio access network transmitters are also converged. That is the unicast RAN and the broadcast RAN um, can be co-located um, and uh, could be in, in, in a unified uh, access network architecture. Uh, similarly, the core network is also converged where the wireless core and the broadcast core uh, can be co-located uh, within the same nodes. Um, Sankhya's uh, solution is based on uh, an SDR platform wherein our SDR SOC is embedded uh, into these converged receivers uh, as well as into uh, the uh, converged uh, radio access networks. Some of the use cases where we feel that such a network could be very, very uh, effectively and efficiently, efficiently utilized are for use cases like emergency alerts and public safety notifications uh, for uh, remote education, where there are multiple number of students who are watching the same content at the same time. Uh, live and OTT content, um, live content like election news, um, OTT content like IPL can all be sent over a one-to-many D2M broadcast broadband converged network. Um, <clears throat> we could also do use cases like um, offloading content that is becoming viral over a broadband network from a, a mobile broadband to a D2M converged broadcast network. Uh, we could also do things like uh, FOTA, SOTA over a D2M broadcast network. Uh, some of the specific use cases for this application are when you want to send entertainment content to a fleet of taxis like Uber and Ola, or if you want to send map data to uh, you know, thousands, millions of cars, uh, or if you want to do firmware upgrade for say um, a Maruti uh, Swift desire of uh, 2022, uh, you, could, you could send selectively content over such a, converged one, uh, one to many uh, converged um, uh, D2M broadcast broadband network. You could also use uh, this kind of a converged network for smart city utility management. Um, the uh, architecture would, uh, uh, on, on a scale, would look something like this. Uh, we have the existing uh, studio equipment. Uh, we have the analytics uh, engine. You have the uh, CDN at the core and at the edge. And then finally, you have the uh, broadcast network co-located with the broadband network, which are sending content selectively uh, to the uh, converged receivers. Some of the converged receivers that we have designed and developed and trialed at our trial network in Bangalore um, are 
uh, a converged um, handset, mobile handset. Uh, we, we've, we've called it the uh, uh, Mark One phone, which is essentially an off-the-shelf LTE, LTE sub phone. And we have embedded our SDR chipset into the Mark One phone so that now it can uh, not only act as an LTE phone, but also uh, a broadcast receiver. We have the dongle that can be connected to a laptop uh, we have the home gateways um, and, and, and several other form factors. Um, to give an example of a FOTA or a SODA broadcast network, um, typically the uh, OEM, like for example, say a Maruti or a, a Hyundai uh, would have a software cloud and it would send software packages um, for their cars over a mobile network. Uh, so the OEM software cloud will send its content over to uh, a mobile network core into the mobile networks RAN, and then finally into uh, the end user's car. Um, what we have demonstrated instead in our trial network is we uh, take the content from the OEM software cloud, send it over to the broadcast core, uh, the broadcast radio access network, and finally into uh, the end user's car. Um, of course, we are not utilizing cars, but we have the ECUs, the uh, electronic control units uh, that are inside the car and connect the ECUs uh, to the laptop so that we can uh, see what is being received over the broadcast network. Um, here's a block schematic of the field trial network uh, in Bangalore. Uh, we have the core network, which essentially comprises of the analytics engine, the encoder, um, the yoga broadcast core, the data formatter, and the scheduler. And we have the um, uh, the broadcast radio access network, which is co-located uh, to one of the um, uh, unicast uh, network uh, service providers, uh, uh, eNode Bs. Uh, and at the receiver end, we have the Mark One phone, we have the dongles that are connected to the laptop, and we have the home gateways. <clears throat> uh, this is a pictorial representation uh, of uh, where the BRH sites are located as compared to the core network. Uh, the core network is located at the Sankhya Labs office, which is not too far from the Chandaswami Stadium. And, uh, and the broadcast radio heads or the broadcast radio access network elements are co-located uh, on, uh, on uh, cellular towers uh, right next to LTE eNode base. Um, some more details about the tower heights, uh, these are rooftop towers, uh, and the AGL is anywhere from um, 25 meters to uh, 35 meters. Uh, we are using an omni antenna. Here are some pictures. We have the BRH that is pole mounted on a rooftop tower. Uh, we have the omnidirectional antenna, and we have the GPS antenna that is uh, connected to the broadcast the radio head. Uh, some more details um, about the receivers and what we have trialed and tested in our trial network. Um, basically, we are using something that we call the Mark One phone, uh, which has an embedded ATSC3 tuner demodulator chip and, um, and the UHF antenna. Um, it is Sankhya's SDR chip, which is <coughs> interworking with Qualcomm's SDM660. Uh, we can receive broadcasted content in flight mode or without a SIM card, uh, which will not even require any authentication. Uh, we have been able to demonstrate successfully handovers or, or um, sending content which is being received over an LTE broadband network and handing it over to a broadcast network and in a reverse direction from a broadcast network to an LTE broadband network. Um, for interactivity, uh, whenever we are receiving uh, broadband data, our broadcast data for interactive interactivity, we are using SMS, USSD, or if available, uh, broadband, either over Wi-Fi 
or over mobile broadband. Uh, we are also uh, we have also demonstrated um, using the Mark One phone as a hotspot and and uh, thus enabling other uh, non-compatible devices to receive the same content over Wi-Fi. Um, we have tested successfully um, over moving vehicles at 60 kilometers per hour, as well as in the metro at uh, an average speed of about 40 kilometers per hour. Um, here's a link of one of our engineers who's watching the content while he's in the metro. Um, <clears throat> um, he's receiving broadcasted content while he's in the metro and he's watching um, a baseball match while keeping an eye on uh, geeky stuff like uh, uh, CORN, SNR, so on and so forth. We asked him to change the orientation and turn off the tech mode so that we can get a better view of um, what he's looking at uh, and how we can receive content, broadcasted content flawlessly, even at uh, the speed of an average speed of 40 kilometers per hour in the metro. Um, in conclusion, all I'd like to say is I'm not saying that uh, broadcast network is better than the broadband network or the other way around. All I'm saying is that um, we should be, the two networks need to be complementary to each other. And, and uh, we have created a converged direct to mobile broadcast broadband network, uh, demonstrated it successfully. And uh, in the next uh, few years, we are hoping to uh, create a network, uh, a nationwide network supporting the same. Um, my coordinates, um, if you have uh, any further questions or need to discuss this in further details. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, Prashant here once again. I guess I forgot to share my screen uh, when I was showing my coordinates. Uh, so <clears throat> feel free to um, let me share my coordinates here quickly for a moment um, for anybody who wants to make a note of that and uh, they can reach out to me as and when required. Thank you once again, everyone, for patiently listening to my uh, recording. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Prashant uh, Maru sir. And we are grateful to you for the detailed uh, presentation. Now uh, the session is open uh, for the questions, and uh, I would request Asif to flash these questions which we have received from the participants and the audience. Now, the question number one, that is ATSC 3.0 is a radio solution for public broadcast services on mobiles. So this question, I would request uh, Mr. Shesh to answer. Uh, Mr. Shesh. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. OK, yes. I, and I agree that, that in, in the initial phases of uh, you know, in fact, in my presentation, I specifically, you know, made made explicit mention of the fact that that the convergence aspect is really so. So, so the right way to say is that it's not integration, deep integration, that the convergence is interworking, and I agree with that. But, but I also, you know, we also have to understand that that even today there is no deep integration between Wi-Fi and and uh, and and 3GPP. Uh, in spite of several several years of efforts, still seventy percent of of you know mobile broadband traffic is 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 on Wi-Fi. So uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Asif, please place the next question. 
so uh, this was the suggestion to madam minakshi and tsdsi uh, basically for the broadcast broadband convergence and the cost study which has been carried out in the national digital communication policy 2018 vision as a new activity so for this uh, i would request uh, prashant maru sir to comment on this question i'm, I'm not uh, sure uh, what exactly is a question it seems more like a suggestion um uh, mr ashwini can you elaborate please um can can somebody give the authority for mr ashwini to speak can i take on his desk sir yes yes please sure i have invited him if he can yeah he joined yeah am i audible asif yes yes you are yes sir you are audible yeah thank you uh, dr preetam and uh, mr maru my point was that uh, first of all uh, in any of my observations and the questions uh, there is no uh, you know remarks on the solutions on atsc etc at all my the total genesis of the entire thing which i am talking about that emerges from the national digital communication policy because uh, i had been closely involved in that the vision was that we are running two separate networks with two set of uh, you know precious low band spectrum therefore is there a possibility that we could bring some efficiencies through convergence at network level spectrum level and all that i was speaking from that perspective and second thing that uh, our case is different from the european region 1 or region 2 case because uh, we have only one state broadcaster which will be sharing the burden uh, entire burden of this uh, stand alone new network we do not have pri private uh, multiple broadcasters who could be using this infrastructure so from that perspective i was suggesting that we should undertake a study within tsdsi or somewhere we could account for our own uh, macro cells or the you know geographical uh, structures within india and uh, spectrum costing etc and uh, the equivalent of the study which uh, mr sesh was has presented from etri we could uh, carry out within indian context perhaps that would be a very good reference document for dot Uh, in order when they start to do the execution of ndcp for this topic broadcast broadband convergence i am not saying and uh, i am i completely agree with the uh, response from mr sesh also that uh, deep integration and all that is not possible uh, i was just saying that we can carry out uh, our india specific study from the costing and to what extent we can do the convergence or the integration or interworking that is that was my suggestion Understood. then we will have a clear view that uh, from the policy ambition to what extent we can go so that policy maker or the implementers are clear on that so um that just to, okay. um to answer your question um uh, mr ashwini uh, we at uh, sankhya labs in coordination close cooperation with IIT Kanpur Prasar Bharati under the guidance of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting we have done a trial in Bangalore which was specifically to look at the aspects that you mention um uh, the commercial aspects uh, the integration aspects so we took a look at that in a small trial network in Bangalore uh, the next step is uh, to uh, kind of create a similar um network trial network in delhi the difference between the trial the two trial networks would be that in in bangalore it constituted um low power low tower broadcast uh, yeah. network elements in, sure. in in delhi it will be a combination of low power low tower and high power high tower once again it is in close cooperation with iit kanpur and prasar bharti and the mib yeah i understand uh, so that is what is work uh, in progress and um, by the end of this um, month by the end of november we will be publishing a report uh, which will address uh, the commercial aspects uh, the the technical aspects of convergence 
uh, which uh, standard should be the standard of choice and why. Um, I think it is extremely important to understand the why which uh, Sesh and, and uh, to some extent uh, Madeline mentioned briefly about how ATSC 3.5 is better and what will be the impact of uh, the standard of choice over CAPEX and OPEX of the operator. Uh, so all this will be looked at and addressed in that report. Um, okay. And it yeah. is that report is basically built on all the observations that we have uh, made in the trial network in Bangalore. And we will uh, make further observations in the trial network in Delhi as well. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Mr. thank Mr. you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Martin. And, and if I could good. add, if I could add as a quick thing, so let's move away from you know a standard A versus standard B versus standard C and get away from that. But but I think I think you know what what we can draw maybe as as a takeaway from this session is that a D two M platform that that is is accessible by a large number of operators on some neutral basis makes a lot of sense for the government uh, to promote and whether that is promoted by a single operator or or public private partnerships or whatever that's a different situation but from a pure technical perspective a d2m platform that will promote the offloading of traffic uh, you know makes sense from a national perspective i'm Thanks. perfectly fine and that perfectly clarifies to that extent it is perfect my you know my uh, question ar arose only from the definition from the policy ambitions which try to do the broadcast and broadband convergence which has multiple implications on licensing regulations and all that spectrum allocation etc but that is a different ball game that uh, for dtm using a large base of mo mobile in india to that extent it is fine it's a evolutionary solution etc that is fine for broadcast what is the future of it but my suggestion to dot prasar bharti was that we should uh, look into the policy ambition to what extent we can go in that uh, ambition that has been set forth that's it thank you very much mr shesh and uh, mr maru thank you thank you sir uh, yeah. we'll keep in touch in uh... asif are there any question because now we are running out of time so if there are, please flash one question. And after that, we will share uh, offline and uh, we will wait for them. So the next question, what challenges question in the okay. uh, we can face in the journey of broadcast broadband convergence? So for this, uh, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Puneet Rathor to comment on this question, please. Uh, thank you. So partly we uh, we were discussing the answers to this on the on the chat as well, and um, and and typically this is like a very broad question about the challenges that would be faced in the journey from uh, broadcast broadband convergence. Uh, this is uh, more about first to begin with understanding very clearly uh, the 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 priority. Uh, from a national point of view of utilizing the broadcast spectrum for this uh, direct to mobile kind of use case and then uh, as a next step clearly identifying how do we quantify say a success metric or or what would be the way to to measure how to how to achieve this goal and and then once we are able to clearly articulate these two things we will be able to uh, move forward or at least uh, accelerate the the journey towards this convergence uh, so that would be the uh, the short answer okay thank you uh, asif flash the next question can sankhya Software defined radio based system be configured to receive DVB T2 also, or it will only work for ATSC 3.0. So, this question also I will request Krishnath uh, Maru sir to answer. Um, yes, uh, the answer is a simple yes because it's an SPR platform. 
uh, on top of that another question is that okay the question is on the screen we are talking about convergence between broadcast and broadband but what about the convergence between existing dtt and the proposed dtt over 3gpp so firstly uh, both the question i would request uh, prashant maru and subsequently we would uh, request uh, um, comments from uh, vinay shrivastava sir also over to prashant maru sir sure um so uh, to answer the first question about um what about the existing dtt um, i i'm guessing you are talking about the existing uh, dvbt2 uh, rollout that has already been in place in india is that correct asif who has placed this questions uh, a clarification can be given to uh, mr ravi saxena his ex isro employee guess is he there on the uh, is he present on the session i think so or we leave it to the interpretation of prashant maru sir you assume uh, whatever you understood and then apply. okay so i'll assume that it is he's talking about dvbt2 um dvbt2 has uh, some drawbacks as compared to the atsc3 standard so um it is better to integrate upgrade to atsc3 and then do the integration with uh, a 5g network uh, specifically because Uh, ATSC3 is inherently um, a, an IP standard. It was uh, built, uh, designed, uh, ground up over an IP standard. Uh, hence, the integration with uh, any 3GPP standards with ATSC3 is far more easier uh, than as compared to with a DVBT2 um, uh, DTT. Uh, so that answers the first question. The second question was on SDR. uh yes um, sankhya's sdr um, um because it's an sdr platform at present we are supporting uh, already we are supporting uh, almost 15 different waveforms that includes uh, dvbt2 as well uh, we can support other uh, waveforms but that would require uh, software design and development uh, to adapt to that uh, new waveform whichever is required but the answer is a clear yes thank you Uh, Mr. Uh, Pishnoi, uh, if I may, um, perhaps uh, Mr. Maru can also answer the question if it was interpreted the other way. In other words, can ATSC 3.0 be carried over a 3GPP network? Which I think is an interesting question because of the flexibility of ATSC 3.0, and perhaps uh, Mr. Maru or others can uh, can address that as a as a possible interpretation of the previous question. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. um uh, session i kind of discussed that uh, earlier today say she want to take that question um no i actually uh, the, the the question sesh is um is basically um can adsc3 uh, be delivered over 5g um a 3gpp 5g well it, it put it this way i think I, i i would answer the question by saying that the atsc3 fi is a separate fi it is a fi on its own and 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 so you know um uh, i i would take the answer as can i work can can i create interworking with the core and you know ashwani ashwani agreed with me that that you know the buzzword today that we should use is interworking it will work with the core but it is a fi on its own and 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 to do the right way i mean you don't you, you know you don't carry wifi over 3gpp or vice versa but wifi is in the device similarly if atsc3 or a a subset of atsc3 a profile of atsc3 that is that is the right from for mobile is in the device then that enables into working uh, through the core thanks uh, another another point that session i discussed earlier today was uh, can some of these advantages be um uh, transposed over to uh, a 3gpp mbms uh, i think that's that's a detailed uh, feasibility study that would be required to be done to actually look into that you know and 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 see if some of these advantages can be transposed over uh, into uh, a 3gpp standard but at present like sesh mentioned uh, atsc3 is a separate file in itself oh, okay sir thank you very much for that maru sir 
So let there be last question uh, for Madeline. Uh, it is on ATSC 3.0. Kindly flash that question, Ashish. Uh, yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, kindly uh, comment, answer on this question. Uh, well, I think the future of broadcasting with ATSC 3.0 is, uh, is a very bright one. And the reason I say that is because ATSC 3.0 as a physical layer comes closer to the Shannon limit than any other technology in the world. And in fact, it is so close to the Shannon limit, which is the theoretical limit of how much data you can send through a radio access network um, for a given signal strength. Since it's so close to the theoretical limit, any improvement to the physical layer in a new system will only yield the very smallest gains in improvement. And so it seems that ATSC 3.0 may remain the state of the art in direct to mo in uh, uh, one to many broadcast systems for many years to come. Once we figure out how to break the Shannon limit, maybe we'll have some new technologies. So looking at ATSC 3.0 as uh, the, the system that has probably come as close to the Shannon limit as any ever will, I think that the future for this technology is very bright. As we see going on in the world today, there is a lot of work deploying ATSC 3.0. Currently, though, mostly to fixed devices, specifically television sets. What's happening in India is extremely exciting and interesting because ATSC 3.0 was designed from the ground up to be a mobile platform, as was shown in Seish's slides with the ability to accommodate the Doppler effect. So we look forward to implementations in the mobile devices, whether they be automobiles, tablets, cell phones, what have you, uh, to really utilize the full power of ATSC 3.0. And I think that some of the reasoning and uh, business drivers behind such adoption will come in accordance with the information that uh, Prashant Maru showed, which is what is the business case? What is the return on investment of putting an ATSC 3.0 tuner in a cell phone, a car, a tablet, what have you? And the answer can be in quality of experience for the user. The answer can be in the reduction in cost of infrastructure build in order to achieve those services. And the answer can be in savings of how much does it cost to send a gigabit of information to those devices. So you can think about OPEX and CAPEX savings over time in exchange for the investment of putting an ATSC 3.0 tuner in the mobile device. And I think those business calculations are underway and um, the actual time to return on investment, I think is something that's being discovered and uh, discussed. But uh, my guess is that that math and that calculation will work out very well. And the future for ATSC 3.0, both in fixed broadcasting as well as mobile broadcasting is very bright. Thank you. Thank you very much man, uh, for the questions. Now, since we have already overshot the time, since the session was there till uh, 1915. So uh, now we will conclude this session. First and foremost thing at the outset, I express my heartfelt gratitude to all the keynote speakers and also all the participants and the delegates who have attended uh, this session of broadcast broadband conversation session six. A lot of important points have been brought out by all these speakers and more than that, uh, these issues have come up during the Q&A session. So towards that, we have achieved more than what we have set the target for us for the session. And in the end, just to conclude, I will just bring out the key points which has emerged from the various speakers, including the Q&A session. First and foremost thing, in the opening session, it was brought out uh, by the co-chair that the convergence technology should bring the affordable convergence technologies to all the citizens. That should be the key areas which should be met as an end state. With the keynote, one speaker, that is Mr. Seishima has brought out why ATSC 3.0 for D2M is essential and he has brought out all the kind of advantages with the various studies in the graphical forms and tabular forms to substantiate this statement of his. By the keynote 
two speaker that is miss madeline noland has brought out that atsc 3.0 has already been tested and is ongoing in various countries including us south korea jamaica brazil and other countries by the keynote three speaker dr punit rathor who has brought out that how multicast and broadcast has also been proposed in various releases at pgpp particularly release 14 in sa2 and also in release 16 and he has also highlighted various study report technical report of the tsdsi on the same subject by the keynote four speaker mr vinay srivastava who has brought out the kra that is scalability coexistence and resource efficiency that we will achieve in the broadcast broadband convergence by the keynote five speaker mr mohammad aziz saga has brought out that the content which are provided by the content providers in addition to the mobile network operators and broadcast network operators they have given the exponential efficient media delivery to the users at affordable rate thereby achieving the spectrum efficiency in addition to the energy efficiency and today's session we we talk about team to achieve sustainable development goals and therefore wherever we save the energy it is going to contribute to the global sustainable development goals by keynote speaker 6 mr prashant maru who has brought out that how the broadcast broadband convergence will bring all these use cases which will be less expensive and how it will cover the entire population particularly for the public safety during the disaster management and that too it will also be green and thereby again contributing to the main theme of sustainable development goals so seeing all these points which has emerged i once again thank each and every team of speaker both the co-chairs the the other people who have attended all the participants because they have attended from 50 60 members on the live sessions which we have even over to for the 10 to 15 minutes thank you so much and we are so grateful to you for the detailed presentations and the answers which were given in the qa session thank you so much jai hind and namaste